Let's get going. All right, so welcome everyone to the uh, December 2019 study group on integration patterns. My name is Emily McCowan. Uh, I live in Australia and I'm going to be presenting this session to you today. Um, so my current role is a Salesforce architect at Deloitte um, and I am also a Kiwi if you happen to pick up some of that accent as I go along. So the agenda that we've got today um, Obviously, I'm doing the welcome now. We'll talk about some of the certification champions that we've got for November. Um, and then we're going to start talking about the integration pattern. So I'm going to discuss um, the four main aspects that Salesforce are going to test you on when it comes to the patterns, which is the layer, the timing, the direction, and the volume. Um, and because I'm going to be giving you a lot of information today and it can be kind of hard to grasp um, without a real world scenario to apply that to, I've made up a little scenario that we can test ourselves on uh, and then we'll have time for questions as well. Along the way, if you have any questions though, um, please don't feel shy to speak up. Just take yourself off mute and ask. I don't mind having questions as we go. Um, there's also Susanna on the call who uh, is going to be monitoring the chat. So if you want to ask your question in the chat window, go ahead and do that. And Susanna will be able to share that with me as well. So if you're relatively new to Ladies Be Architects, um, a little bit of background about us. Uh, Gemma is our founder. Um, she's based over in the UK. And she has a couple of co-leaders, um, Susanna, who's on the call with us today, and also Charlie, who are both from the US. And then there's myself and Vicky. We're both the um, Australia slash New Zealand ambassadors based here in Brisbane. So some champions. Um, We've got some people who got the platform app builder. So congratulations, Lindsay, Noreen, Chandana, and Sarah. Well done. Woohoo! Great job, guys. One person who got the identity and access management designer. So congratulations, Michelle. I attempted this this month and was not successful. So I know how hard it is, um, and I'll be trying to do that again in the new year for sure. So congratulations, Great Michelle. Woohoo! Uh, a couple of data architecture and management designer certs. Um, Danielle, who has a very, um, I guess, mysterious profile online. I couldn't find a picture at all, but that's okay. Uh, and Jessica, congratulations to you both. Great job. Yeah. Oh, great, um, we have Chandana on the phone, it looks like. <laughs> oh, Chandana, well done. Hey, thanks for joining. Okay. Correct us if we're pronouncing your name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please do. Um, so the uh, data architecture cert got Jessica her application architect, which is fantastic. Um, that's half the pyramid done. And then Sneha as well got her application architect Yay. cert. Well done, ladies. And then Michelle with that identity exam pass got her system architect, which is the other half of that pyramid. So amazing work, Yay. Michelle. So well done. Um, I know there have probably been a couple more cert passes in the last week, um, but we will definitely be announcing and celebrating those. And if you haven't seen already, we did recently get a new female CTA, um, Jillian, who got a pass the other day. So a massive congratulations to her. That's amazing news. So if you want swag, if you want to be celebrated as a certification champion, um, please either tweet us, post in our Ladies Be Architects Trailblazer community chatter group, um, and hop onto this bit.ly link we're sharing, uh, and give us your, your details and your address, and we can send you some swag to celebrate um, passing those sets. Yes, and congrats. I see Noreen is on the line too. I think we recognized her. So congrats, Noreen. Thanks for joining us today. Awesome. All right. So as Gemma would say, let's get on. Um, today we're going to be focusing on a topic from the Integration Architecture Designer Exam. So this one sits on that system architect side of the Salesforce architect pyramids. Uh, and the topic, obviously, is Salesforce integration patterns. 
Now the integration exam, it has a pretty hefty amount of content to absorb and digest. Um, integration patterns are just one part of it. Um, and I failed this exam the first time I tried it, although I did kind of deserve that because I didn't put enough study hours in if I'm totally honest with myself. And um, the good news is that I studied some more and when I took it again a couple of weeks later, I did pass. Um, integration patterns as a topic focuses a lot on the meta information about an integration. So I won't be talking today so much about what the different integration methods are and how to use them, like outbound messages and HTTP callouts. Instead, we're going to take a step back and talk about all the different aspects of integration requirements that you need to understand um, before you can pin down the right integration solution for a given use case. So I'll help you understand what the layer, timing, direction and volume has to do with selecting an integration pattern. Um, and this is a pretty good chunk of the exam at 17% weighting. So it's definitely a good one to focus some time on. Yeah, and I just chime in that um, the, the direction and Emily's going to walk us through the direction, but that's like 50% of the battle and it sounds simple, but knowing like which patterns are inbound versus outbound and remembering that concept is, is really, really key. Yes, awesome. Thanks, Susanna. And please chime in with any um, extra, uh, I guess, comments or info that you have in your brain because I'm sure I haven't captured everything. <laughs> All right, so the patterns. Um, there are six patterns to choose from for the purposes of this exam. They are uh, remote process invocation, request and reply, remote process invocation, fire and forget, UI updates based on data changes, data virtualization, remote call ins. And the last one, batch data synchronization. But what integration methods do each of these patterns represent? Uh, and when would you select one of them? That's what we need to focus on today. So let's step through each of those four considerations I've mentioned, the integration layer, the timing, the direction, and the volume. We'll start with the layer. Um, so there's four different types of integration layers. The first one is uh, security. So the security integration layer, layer is all about um, identity and access management. It's a pretty big domain. Obviously, it actually has its own exam in the Salesforce Architect Pyramid. So when you're thinking about security layer integrations, think single sign-on, automated user provisioning. Um, integrations at the security layer are all about user authentication and authorization and trying to improve that user experience and minimize administrative effort. Secondly, there's the user interface layer. Um, so this layer is about combining the UI of two or more systems. So I'm talking about something like you might have heard of Salesforce Canvas, where you can configure a third party app to display within your Salesforce page or maybe Salesforce's user interface API, which you can leverage to display Salesforce page layouts within a third party app. Thirdly is the business logic layer. Um, so think about an end to end process that a business might have. For instance, um, say you've got lead generation through the sales process through to order dispatch. That's your end to end process. But that might be spread across multiple systems in an organization. So maybe you handle leads in your sales process, including quotes and maybe a bit of billing within Salesforce, but you use a separate system for inventory management and order dispatching. Um, so you would use some sort of, um, I guess, setup of inbound and outbound calls to and from your Salesforce org to achieve an orchestrated seamless flow between those two or multiple systems that provide each part of that business process. So it's about orchestrating those end-to-end -end processes across multiple systems um, and Apex Collapse is just one of many, many examples of, of how you can do that. And finally, fourthly is the data layer. 
So this one's about data flows, um, whether it's data coming into Salesforce or going out of Salesforce. And it could be something as simple as a direct upsert that you have scheduled, or maybe it's something really tricky, like a complex data update that requires transformation um, or maybe references between data tables to be maintained across multiple upserts. Um, so like an example of that would be if you were uploading um, a series of new accounts with related contacts. Um, so an example, I guess, could be a daily upsert of leads that was provided to you by a third party lead generation company um, would be one example. Any questions so far about the different layers? Nothing in the chat so far. Awesome. All right. So how do those patterns uh, we're studying match up with the layers that I've just described? Um, so I've got a little table here to try and make that um, as clear as possible. Um, so that request and reply pattern is appropriate for the security or business logic integration layers because uh, request and reply is about sending out a message and waiting to get a response from whatever third party system you're communicating with. The user doesn't do anything else or the system doesn't do anything else until that reply is received. Um, fire and forget is good for business logic, but I don't think it's that appropriate for security. Um, and the reason for that is fire and forget is a pattern for sending out a message similar to request and reply, but it doesn't wait for that reply. So you can't really be sure that your message was received yet or when it's going to be processed. Um, now you can string together a, a series of separate messages with a fire and forget pattern. Um, and you can get a response later from the system that you're communicating with. But while you're waiting for that response to come back at whatever unknown point in the future, um, it, you definitely shouldn't be taking any security layer related actions. Um, like giving someone access when you're not really sure that they are who they say they are or that they're really authorized to do what they want to do. And because they'll have to wait too, right? Like you don't want a user just wait, sitting, sitting there waiting for something to come back when you don't exactly. know come back. Yeah, sometimes that's really inefficient. So definitely it's good if you want people to just be able to move on with their day. Um, UI updates on data changes, well, it's in the name. It's related to the data layer. Um, because this pattern is about displaying something to a user when a data change happens um, without that user having to refresh their page. So an example of that would be a page showing a continuous stream of alerts to a user. And that user isn't clicking anything. It's not like they're refreshing their page to get the latest chatter post. The, update, the updates are happening elsewhere, but the user is being informed about those changes in real time. Um, data virtualization, again, that's on the data layer. Um, from what I understand, data virtualization is about displaying data from a third party system within Salesforce without that user having to actually go into that third party system. So think uh, Salesforce Connect and external objects and having that external data source. Um, that's where you can map in data from another system as and when you need it. Um, and bring that across regularly so it's visible and it's actionable within Salesforce. And I think the key there, right, is that it's not, um, your, the user isn't like going into that system to get it, they don't have to log in, but also that data isn't being saved in the tables in Salesforce either. It's not taking up like a space in an object or anything like mm. that. It's just on the UI, it's not saved to the database. Yeah, it's just like a throwaway. When I need to look at this, I wanna see it. Uh, remote call-in, it's basically the opposite of request and reply or fire and forget, as in it's about external systems calling into Salesforce. So it's similar to request and reply and fire and forget in that it can be appropriate for the security or the business logic layer. And finally, there's batch data synchronization. Um, again, it's in the name, it's about the data layer. So you might notice that none of Salesforce's integration patterns that they're gonna test you on in the, the exam matches the user interface integration layer that I talked about. Um, so I'm not really sure why that is. And the user interface integration layer isn't really documented in 
the Integration Patterns and Practices Guide, um, which was a massive study guide for me when I was doing this exam. Um, even though it very much exists within Salesforce, um, so definitely don't ignore that and the, the tools that you have to do those user interface layer, integra layer integrations when you're studying. Um, yeah, but it just not, didn't show up on the table. Yeah, not on the table, but on the exam, definitely. Like um, I think Emily had in one of the previous slides, like a, uh, you'll hear the term UI mashup a lot. And that's mm. you know usually talking about like a canvas, like a canvas app, but yeah. definitely doesn't yeah, come in the table. <laughs> yeah, definitely study canvas and things like that. In, in, in your preparation for the exam. So uh, if there's no other questions about that, I can move on to the next layer. Cool, which is timing. So there are two types of integration timing. Um, the first one is synchronous. And I remember first learning the term synchronous versus the opposite, which is asynchronous. And it took a little while for it to settle in my brain you know, what it meant, which one was which. I try and remember it like this. Um, when something is in sync or synced up, it's in alignment. Um, so synchronous integrations are those where the integration happens in real time and each step happens one after the other. So if you think back to that example I gave when I talked about that business process integration layer, the business logic, um, and, and I talked about the concept of managing leads in a sales process in, sal in Salesforce and having order and dispatch fulfillment somewhere else. So imagine that you're a user, you've just completed a sales process, you've closed your opportunity, you've processed some payment for a customer order. Um, and if you needed to send a message at that point across to the dispatching system to get that order underway, and you decided that that user had to wait until they got a dispatch reference code confirming that order has been received and here's the code, you can save this in your system. And um, before they can do anything else in Salesforce, that would be an example of a synchronous integration. So you have to have a response before the user can proceed with what's next. Um, secure, uh, synchronous integrations are also necessary for authentication calls. So that's when you're integration, integrating on the security layer. So if you use one of the authentication flows that Salesforce offers, um, which is definitely something covered in the identity exam, it's when you need to send information about the user and wait for an access token to be sent back. That definitely requires a synchronous integration. You have to wait for the um, identity provider to say, yes, I know who this person is before you can move on and give them any access. So asynchronous obviously is the opposite of synchronous. If something is asynchronous, it means it's not in sync and the steps can happen independently of one another. Um, now I really do recommend using asynchronous integration whenever you can. It's not always possible. Sometimes you do need something to be synchronous. Um, but because when you're dealing with integrations, you're introducing layers of complexity into your business process. You know, you're relying on other systems being up um, and that's not always the case. You, you could have an enterprise service bus that goes down. Maybe internet service is patchy. Um, things can get in the way of your integration executing smoothly. So asynchronous integration is about waiting until those system resources are available to process your integration message, um, which doesn't necessarily mean that it takes a long time. Um, a lot of asynchronous integrations can be near real time. And as far as the user is concerned, it's happened immediately. But what it does do is remove that real-time reliance on systems being up and available all the time. So yeah, asynchronous is great for avoiding any systems issues that might cause your synchronous integrations to fail. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, you can string multiple integration messages together in that fire and forget pattern. So you could replicate that send message and receive reply behavior of a synchronous integration, um, even if you're using an asynchronous integration. 
for instance, using something like an outbound message with a callback um, is a really common way of doing that. So you could have the same scenario where you have a user who's completed a sales process, they've closed that opportunity, and they need to send that dispatch information to the system. Use fire and forget to send that message off. And then when the dispatching system receives that and creates the reference, you just configure a message there to come back and say, hey, here's that reference code you wanted. Just automatically save that on the opportunity. The user doesn't have to wait. They can go and move on and start processing another customer order if they need to, um, which means that your users can get on to the next task in their day a lot more quickly. Um, oh, and another example I've got is anything that's a batch, basically, anything that's done on a schedule and is not done automatically is an example of a asynchronous um, message or integration. Any questions there on the timing? Nothing in the chat yet. Cool. Awesome. All right. So how do those patterns map to the timing? So request and reply is synchronous, um, and that's because you're sending a message and you're waiting for that response before you can proceed. And fire and forget is asynchronous because you literally fire a message and then forget about it. Um, you send your message and then go about your other business without worrying if the third party system has received and processed your message yet. A UI update based on data changes is asynchronous. And that's because um, it's about firing off a message when something happens that's going to show an alert on someone's page. But you don't need that person or the system to confirm that that data update message has been received. You just fire it off. Um, data virtualization is synchronous because that's, you know, what Susanna and I were talking about earlier. Um, it's about picking up that data when you need it. You don't save it in Salesforce. Um, when you click on a record of an external object, it says, hey, other system, what data have you got? And it sends you that data and loads it on the screen for you then and there. Um, remote call-ins can be either, and that's because it represents a third-party system remotely sending information or requests into Salesforce. So like I was saying, it's kind of the opposite of request and reply and fire and forget. Um, and it, you, could, you could set it up as either from that third party system. And finally, batch data synchronization is asynchronous. Remember, it's got that word batch in it. Um, and batches are, I guess, pretty much always asynchronous. Um, generally, this represents large volumes of data being processed concurrently. And um, for anyone who's studied that data architecture exam, you know that there are some topics there about loading bulk data and being able to process um, MODs simultaneously using the bulk API that's all asynchronous processing. All right, direction. So direction is, as Susanna said, it's pretty straightforward. One. So before moving in, uh, moving on, uh, Emily, we do have one question yeah, sure. on the previous slide. Um, so Praveen was asking, um, can you explain again why UI update based on data changes and data virtualization timings are different? Yeah, cool. So a UI update mm -hmm. is, yep. um, imagine you've created a, basically a replica of a chatter page. Someone's in a chatter group. But instead of having to click refresh on that page every time a new post is made, it just loads it. And it's constantly polling and saying, are there any updates? Are there any updates? Anytime there is an update, you're sending off a message and you're saying, hey, update your UI because there's been a data change. But I don't care if you do it or not. I'm not going to wait for you to confirm that you've made that update before I continue you know, checking and sending messages. So that's why it's asynchronous. The system sending the update doesn't care if the, um, I guess, subscriber system hasn't received that. They just expect that it will, and they can publish it in their own time. It might be immediate, or it might take a minute. Just depends on whether um, those systems are up. 
and a listening. Exactly. And I think another nuance on the um, fire and forget um, pattern too is, um, you know, when you send that initial message, you're going to get a synchronous response from the external system that says, yep, I got the message. Like, yes, I'm up. Yes, I, you know, uh, I got it. So that happens synchronously. But then the actual response, like within information or things like that, um, that comes asynchron asynchronously. So that's just another little nuance in that fire and forget pattern. Yeah, with that one, um, because your outbound message could be going to so many different places, you could be sending it to directly to a system if it's a point-to-point -point integration, but you could be sending it to a, an ESB or a gateway, um, and it's just about that first system saying, hey, yep, cool, thanks, thanks for the message. But you're not really probably going to do anything much besides monitor for failures with that one, which would just say, oh, that system's off and down. That's a bummer. And a lot of those um, fire and forget systems that you use will retry until they get a success. So outbound messages have like a, a pattern of retrying over a 24 hour period, I think it is. And it's, you know, they're retrying like every minute and then it goes to every hour and then after like three hours um, uh, and, and just checking to see that the system is up. So eventually it'll probably get there. Okay. And then just one more question before we move on. I see Suresh asked how the how Salesforce will know when to make an external call based on resource availability. Um, and I think the answer to that is, you know, Salesforce won't necessarily know when to make the call. They'll make the call. And then based on, you know, what Emily was saying, like if they get a message that says the system is down and you have you have coded or uh, most likely coded um, some sort of like application log that receives that response from whatever system, um, you could see that, you know, that system's down and maybe you have some logic in place for, you know, your call out to retry if you get a message that, you know, an external system is down. But you're, you're right in asking that question, Suresh, like Salesforce doesn't know if the external system is up or not. Um, that's something that, you know, almost like error of logic that you need to, to accommodate for in your, your code or your config. Yeah, exactly that. Um, a lot of systems have, you know, they share codes, common codes. You know, if you go to a website and it says 401 page not found, it's similar to that. There are common codes that systems know, oh, error 500, that means something's wrong. Um, so it's relatively easy to code in that kind of logic. If you receive any of these codes, do a retry in five minutes or something like that. And, and you know, those declarative tools do sometimes have retries built in, like, like the outbound message that I mentioned. Is everyone happy that we've answered those questions? I think so. No more questions on this one. I think we can move cool. along, but yeah. thanks for the questions. Keep keep them coming when you have them. Yeah, really good questions. Thank you. Okay, so direction. Um, like Susanna said, it's relatively straightforward. There's only two options, um, but it does mean a lot. So when you're considering the integration direction, you're deciding what's the source system and what is the target? What's the publisher and what's the subscriber? So you can have a direction of an integration going from Salesforce out to another system or from another system into Salesforce. So you want to consider where does the data or business process originate from, where is it going to end up, how are you triggering that message, those sorts of considerations. So it's probably easier to just jump straight into the table and talk about what each one is and why. Um, so request and reply, fire and forget, um, UI update based on data changes and data virtualization are all examples of calls going from Salesforce to another system. Um, so request and reply and fire and forget, they're about sending messages um, like we were talking about. It's to do with security or the business logic layer. So that trigger um, for that process has started at the Salesforce side. And maybe you're going to another system to ask it for some information to come back and continue with your process in Salesforce. Or maybe you're just sending another um, message to a system to let it know that something's happened so that it can do something it needs to do.
Um, but they're both examples of the direction being from Salesforce into another system. Now the UI update based on data changes, um, it's from Salesforce to another system, but you know, it's pretty true that often the other system is going to be Salesforce. So it's, it could be, you know, Salesforce to Salesforce really, if you think about it. Um, but it's definitely starting at the Salesforce side and maybe it's going to an external web page or maybe it's going to another Salesforce org, maybe it's going to the Salesforce org that you're in, but it's another area of it. So it's still that direction of Salesforce to whatever third party system. Um, and then data virtualization, uh, because it's about asking another system, what data have you got? Show me. Um, you're triggering that from Salesforce, you're asking for that information and then you're displaying it within your Salesforce screen. Then remote data call-ins and batch data synchronization are the opposite. They're examples of a third-party system triggering a call-out, maybe a request, or maybe an upsert of data into Salesforce. So I've said a couple of times that remote call-in is like the flip side of request and reply or fire and forget. So the system might be asking Salesforce for some information before it can progress with what it needs to do. Or maybe it's just telling Salesforce something's happened and then your Salesforce system can continue with what it needs to do. And then that batch data synchronization is usually about bringing those big sets of data into Salesforce, whether you need to transform it first or not. Are there any question about the direction of these patterns? So we have one, one question that was answered, but I'll just recap it for, for folks on the phone. Um, someone asked about how to achieve publish subscribe pattern um, for inbound and outbound. And then um, Suresh chimed in, you know, using platform events and that's exactly right. You can use platform yes. events or also the streaming API. Uh, and then one other question was around um, which integration pattern does the Canvas app fall into? Yeah, so that's, um, it's weird. And I mentioned it earlier, it doesn't actually have a pattern that it, matches so much because it's a mashup and it's about that um, user interface layer that doesn't match to any of the patterns that Salesforce tests you on. So good question. Uh, it's not really data virtualization. So you're, you're calling to another system and you're saying, hey, what have you got? But you're actually just displaying that third party system within a Salesforce page with, um, with Canvas. So mm -hmm. Yeah. And like it's, yeah, I would agree. It's like kind of closest to data virtualization, but it also has a piece, right, of authentication and that security layer that Emily was mentioning. Because the, the cool thing about Canvas is that, you know, you're able to uh, like authenticate into a system and see things and um, sort of pass a little bit of information back and forth. But it's, yeah, it doesn't neatly fit into any of these patterns. Yeah. Um, I am going to share at the end of this session um, some links to some great resources that will help. And I've, I mentioned it earlier, but the um, Integration Patterns and Practices, um, I guess, workbook that Salesforce have is an amazing resource because you can drill into each of these patterns and it's going to show you what are the different tools that you can use in Salesforce to actually implement one of these patterns and what are they like? What use cases are they good for? So when would you use platform events versus outbound messages versus change data capture? Um, you'll be able to understand all of that. But this would be a very long study session if we covered both the integration methods and the patterns at the same time. So it's definitely a, a next steps to look at and um, increase your knowledge. Any other questions there? Uh, just one more question about subscribing, more, more platform specific. Um, and I would just respond. So it's around, um, you know, can Salesforce subscribe to a topic? And yes, Salesforce can subscribe to a topic that's, um, you know, coming in from like, um, like a Comet D uh, publisher. Um, and that would be handled like in the platform event um, definition itself so that is possible and there's a, a lot of great um documentation around platform events and what's possible and what's not possible um in the documentation we can we can share that as well yeah awesome thanks susanna
So that brings us to the fourth um, pattern consideration, which is volume. So with volume, this can get a bit complex. So I'll get the simple ones out of the way first, and then I'll dive into the more complicated volume and limitations discussion. So first, you've got those patterns that are about small data volumes and real-time activities. Um, they are request and reply and data virtualization. Um, because with both of, both of these patterns, if you remember, their timing is synchronous. So when you're sending a synchronous message and you're waiting for a reply, you do get restricted by timeouts, um, like 120 seconds for an HTTP call out. Um, and you're also restricted by apex call limits to the maximum size of a request or a response that you can get. So imagine if you uh, wanted to update 1,000 records via an integration, um, you wouldn't want to sit there and send the call out, wait for a reply, finish that one, and then start a new one. Because if each one took the full 120 seconds, that would be over 33 solid hours of nonstop integration triggering and runtime. Um, so it's really about small data volume. You know, you want to send a small message off. Maybe you've got a couple of records included in it, and you're going to get a bit of information back and update something. Or you're asking for a bit of data at one time um, from that third party system to do your data virtualization with those external objects. So keep those small. Um, but the others, well, it depends. So for fire and forget, for UI update based on data changes, um, those remote call-ins from third party systems and batch data synchronization, um, the volumes that are appropriate are going to differ based on a few different things about how you're going to implement the integration pattern. So let me just expand on that. What does it depend on? So it all depends on the method of integration that you choose and the org that you're working in. So each method is going to be subject to different limits. Um, and some of those are hard limits that Salesforce set. Um, others are dependent on the individual org. Um, so often there are license or addition dependent limits. Perhaps maybe you've purchased an add-on to increase those particular soft limits in the org. Um, so hard limits are those ones that are put in place by Salesforce to make sure all of their customers play nicely with one another in that shared multi-tenant architecture that is how Salesforce works. Um, as you know, your org is sharing those server resources with thousands and thousands of other Salesforce orgs out there. But that just makes our jobs as architects more fun because we have to try and figure out the best approach. So we call them hard and soft limits because hard limits Salesforce just can't change. It's not going to um, make any difference whether you ask them nicely or not. But those soft limits you can buy or um, configure your licensing in such a way that you have the right number of um, call out to whatever you need available to you. So I'll give you some examples of some of those limits. Um, so I'm sure you've all heard of the term governor limits before. Um, governor limits that apply per Apex transaction and include things like total SOQL query limits or total number of callouts in a um, single transaction, that kind of thing. So one example is you have a maximum of 150 DML statements per transaction. And if you're not familiar with DML, it means data manipulation language. And that represents uh, actions like insert, update, or delete of a record. So as an example, if you update a single record within a, an integration transaction, that would count as one DML statement. So if you're using Apex to achieve your integration, um, and you're going to go over those 150 DML statements per transaction, you need to make your code more efficient. You need to use um, groupings or lists and update them all together. Um, or perhaps you need to look at a different solution. Another limit is your API callout limits. Um, so these are calculated on a 24 hour period. Um, your developers might have done an excellent job of making their integration code super efficient 
meaning that you're not hitting any governor limits like that 150 DML statement limit I mentioned. But if you're still triggering too many API calls by doing too many integration callouts in the 24 hour period, you're still going to be blocked. So an example of these limits, these are soft limits. Um, every full Salesforce license you've purchased in your unlimited edition Salesforce org, you'll get 5,000 API call apps per 24 hours. But this varies wildly between all the different licenses and the different editions of Salesforce that you could purchase, um, whether it's professional or enterprise or unlimited or, or something else. And it also depends on which API you're using because they all have their own layer of limitations and limits. So for example, the bulk API um, actually limits you to 10,000 total batches per 24 hours. And it doesn't impact the API callout limits that I spoke about. So maybe you have an integration that was causing you to hit those API callout limits. And you think, okay, well, maybe I need to move this to the bulk API and then I'm no longer going to be consuming those API callouts. And that's great, but you still have to make sure that you're not hitting those 10,000 batches per 24 hours limit. So the consideration of volumes is really not simple, um, and I don't have an easy answer for you, I'm sorry. Um, and I don't think there's any, time, any way we could have enough time to go through all of it. Um, but I have included some resources at the end um, of this slide deck as well. Uh, that we'll share, and we'll share the slide deck um, on the Ladies Be Architects website that will help. Um, so I definitely re recommend having a look at that integration um, developer documentation that Salesforce provides. It has some excellent detail. It has diagrams of each of the patterns and that catalog that I mentioned of the best integration methods, um, and that will help you select which method once you know which pattern um, that you're going to use. Questions about so we, Yeah, so we have a good question um, from Missy Longshore. So she says, does bulk API mean the data is no longer instantly sent back and forth? Yeah, so bulk API is an asynchronous um, API. So you can schedule it to process many, many, many records at once, um, but it will not be happening synchron synchronously. That doesn't mean it won't happen really quickly, um, but it just may, might take some time. And you know, if you're dealing with millions of data records as well, that is gonna take some time to process. But by putting it in the bulk API, you can have your batches running simultaneously. So you could have 10 batches of 100,000 and that would get done quicker than one batch of a million. Right, yeah, the bulk, exactly what Emily said with the, um, the, the key concept around if you're trying to decide between bulk API and uh, like REST is the fact that with bulk API, you can uh, operate your transaction in parallel. So instead of having everything just, um, you know, go in your 200 chunks, cause we, you know, you have limits around how many records can be processed at once. You can have multiple batches that fire all at once. So in parallel um, and depending on what type of data you're working with that can increase the speed dramatically. But again, it depends, right? Like if you're trying to um, operate on uh, multiple batches that all look up to the same like parent record, for instance, um, then having things operate in parallel might actually cause you to see some failures because you'll see those same like uh, uh, failures around like record locking or things like that. So it's mm -hmm. always it's always a trade off. But um, yeah, bulk API can sometimes be uh, a little faster than others. So great, uh, great question. Thanks, Missy. Any other questions? Nothing right now in the chat. Oh, all right. So I have a summary. Feel free to take a screenshot of this, uh, this slide. Um, so I've got a summary of each of the patterns and the considerations for each um, that we've talked about. So I hope this helps you to understand each of the patterns Salesforce tests on for the exam. Um, but like I said, this is a lot of information and it can be tricky to absorb what this really means without some real world use cases to look at. So um, let's have a look at a real life integration scenario and 
together we can pick the right pattern or patterns that would we'll use to uh, meet this um, requirement. So our friends at Universal Containers, um, they've got a Salesforce org and it's being used for sales and support and they have an ERP which does have APIs available which is used for billing and accounting functions. So scenario one, when an account is created in Salesforce, a matching account must also be created in the ERP and the ERP account ID should be stored back on the Salesforce account record. And scenario two, the ERP is a system of record for billing attributes like a customer's pay cycle, current account payment status, whether they're active or they're overdue on their payments. And these attributes need to be visible within Salesforce on the account and kept up to date when they change. So let's break down the components of these requirements against the layer, the timing, the direction, and the volume. So the layer for both is business logic because it's an end-to-end -end process flow. For scenario one, the ERP account is created when the Salesforce account is created. And for two, the Salesforce account billing attributes are updated when the ERP account is updated. So it's both about the business logic going back and forth. The timing for both, again, is asynchronous. And that's because there was no explicit requirement that told us that this needed to be a real-time synchronous integration. So we should try and default to asynchronous because synchronous integrations do introduce risks to your integration. And if it's not necessary, if not truly necessary, it's best to avoid. The direction, uh, we have both. So for scenario one, we have an integration going from Salesforce to the ERP. And for two, it's from the ERP into Salesforce. And finally, for volume, we don't have enough information here, so this is currently unknown. So it's possible that the volumes could be tiny, meaning that a synchronous integration would be okay. Or there could be such vast volumes of account data um, or large numbers of updates that are happening within a 24 hour period that we start to hit some Salesforce limits, but maybe not. So I've marked that one as currently unknown. So does anyone have any thoughts? Anyone want to chime in with what they think might be the right integration pattern for either of these scenarios? Don't be shy. Susanna, is anything coming through on the chat? Yeah, we have one, we have one um, comment in the chat from Sanjeev. Uh, he says, uh, fire and forget with callback. And then awesome. someone, uh, Karen says, uh, continue pattern. Then, cool. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, and then, yep. Someone else said fire and forget as well. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Cool. Well, that is the answer to scenario one. Yes, it is fire and forget. So when an account is created in Salesforce, we have to create that matching account in the ERP and the ERP account ID should be stored back on that Salesforce account record. So that's a fire and forget pattern. And there's a few ways that you could achieve it, but probably the simple one, and I have said it a million times, is outbound messages with callbacks. It's a super easy declarative way to integrate with another system. Um, for number two, now, this one was a little bit trickier, and it certainly could have been uh, more than one option depending on what the volume or timing of that integration requirement was. Um, but I've put it as a remote call-in and that's because there was no explicit requirement for synchronous information and the volumes are still unknown. So I've got a little table highlighting why those two patterns match the um, requirement. So we know that fire and forget happens the business logic layer. It's an asynchronous timing. It's from Salesforce to another system and it really depends. 
Uh, the remote call in is also at the business logic layer. Um, it's asynchronous. It's the system coming to Salesforce and it also depends on the volume. So we don't know. Certainly it could have been data virtualization for scenario two if we didn't need to do anything with that data once Salesforce could see it and it was just about someone viewing it. Uh, and we knew that that was small real time data, uh, even though data virtualization is the direction from Salesforce to another system. It's because at the point of requesting the information it comes that that request comes from Salesforce, but it's still about the system giving you the data. But yes, in the scenario, remote call-in is the most appropriate based on what we know um, about the volume or what we don't know rather about the volume and the timing. So question time, any other questions? Nothing so far. Well, actually we do have one. Uh, we have a, a great question. So how can we evaluate costs and licensing impacts of the different integration patterns in a real world scenario? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna say, say it again. <laughs> have a look at the uh, Salesforce integration patterns and practices guide. Um, analyze the requirements and have a think about what pattern you think it would be and then have a look at those patterns and what options there are um, in the table for each pattern. It's going to show you, okay, here are all the ways that you can achieve this integration pattern using Salesforce tools. And then you can compare that against what you have. Um, do you have lots of Apex call out limit um, available to you? If you're not already using it for other applications within Salesforce, awesome. You've got a lot of licensing, maybe you've got unlimited edition, that's cool. Um, maybe you don't and you need to look at some of the other options and it does sort of rate them and it talks about the pros and cons of using each option. But you should be able to make an informed decision about what pattern or maybe a couple of patterns would be the most appropriate before you start to go in and, and look at what integration options there are. Do you have any additional thoughts on that, Susanna? Yeah, I might just add that. So so as far as you know, Salesforce licensing concerns, yeah, I, I agree. What I would be more concerned with in a real-life scenario is two things. One, the, um, the, the I guess the, the cost involved in potentially building out like a very complex, you know, like call out or um, some sort of integration that involves like the, the generation of Apex versus trying to leverage something like an outbound message, like the trade-offs involved in those two costs, because those are, are very real. Um, and then also, you know, in a real life scenario, especially with like a large, larger organization or an organization that, that might have a lot of like, data sensitivity, maybe, you know, financial systems or, or healthcare, um, a lot of the times you're not going to necessarily be using an Apex call out directly in real life. Um, you might be leveraging uh, maybe like a some sort of middleware tool. And I believe that the documentation goes into some of those details as well as like, when would you leverage uh, a third party middleware tool, um, mm -hmm. something like an ETL or an EAI. Um, and, and there's a whole, you know, we could do a whole other session on that. But um, I think that's another sort of like costing trade off and like, obviously like licensing and standing up a tool like that has some costs involved. But sometimes mm -hmm. the trade offs with security there are, are worth that cost. Definitely. And there's a sort of a real world versus exam difference there too. Definitely when you're studying um, and the material that you see and the way that they test you in the exam, they really lean towards using systems that provide you um, with integration capability rather than self-build. So yeah. a lot of the time the answer is gonna be use middleware, but that's not you know, necessarily mm -hmm. realistic because middleware can be expensive. Yeah, um, definitely. So yeah, good question. Awesome. Oh, thank you, Missy. Thank you for the kind comment. To this. Thank you, Emily, for the you know using human language to describe these contexts. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I take inspiration <laughs> from Chris Duarte. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. I know we're at one minute over. I don't want to, there aren't any other questions. We want to be sensitive to your time, but um, thank you all for joining. And 
Um, just one note, I forgot, I had one job to, to remind myself of and I forgot, but I did want to tell uh, the champions that are on the line and any champions that are listening to this recording, we will be sending something out to you in the mail uh, for your uh, certification achievement. So be on the lookout for that. Woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll share the recording, we'll share the slide deck so you can have the links to some of the stuff I'm sharing. So I've got these um, extra uh, tools and, and guides that can help you along your way. Good luck with all your study and exams, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening or, or day, <laughs> wherever you're based. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.